Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Evolution of Telehealth and a Changing Healthcare Landscape, presented by CAQH Core and Weedy. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and just go over some administrative details. As you have noticed, everyone has been placed on mute for the entire presentation. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session, so please don't hesitate to add any questions or comments into the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel. You can go ahead and download the presentation slides at www.caqh.org slash core slash events, and we'll also have it on the weedy.org site after the webinar. They will be emailed to all of the registrants within the next one to two business days as well. And um, we did have some questions that were submitted during the registration process. We appreciate that and we'll get to those first. If you have any technical issues, please use the questions panel as well and we'll be following up with you privately so that way we don't dis disrupt the webinar. Without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to the Weedy Telehealth Workgroup co-chairs, Nancy Spector and Allison Armstrong. And Nancy is also the chair of our Weedy board. Nancy and Allison, would you like to talk about the Weedy Telehealth Workgroup and what we've been up to? Thanks, Sam and Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Um, are you going to start us off? You can go ahead and start. That's fine. All right, great. Um, so Nancy and I, uh, hi everybody, Nancy and I are the co-chairs of Wheaties Telehealth Workgroup. Um, I work at Anthem. I am a public policy director there and uh, Nancy Spector is with the American Medical Association. So in our work group, I think we bring a really unique perspective of a payer and provider together um, to explore this changing landscape in telehealth. Um, we are a work group that meets monthly and we develop a lot of uh, informational materials, resources, as well as put together educational webinars, um, uh, fact sheets and uh, participated interviews and podcasts and uh, do a lot of great work there while we look at the changing landscape of telehealth. Um, on to the next slide. I think somebody else is controlling those. Um, we have, as I mentioned, put together a lot of resources related to telehealth. Uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, our work group had done a lot of work to set the stage um, for what is telehealth, how is it used, what are some of the issues around accessing telehealth. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2020, early 2020, at the very onset of the pandemic, we had just finalized a uh, a resource paper on overcoming barriers to the broader adoption of telehealth. So uh, where we laid out a lot of recommendations that were adopted by CMS that opened up telehealth coverage um, over the course of the pandemic. And now as we think about what that changing landscape is gonna look like moving forward. Um, our work group now uh, with all of these advancements in telehealth has really, um, shifted gears a little bit in our work to explore the, the next phase of telehealth. So we, you know, spent a lot of time previously looking at barriers to accessing care. And now we're really shifting to look at what do providers need to do to stand up a telehealth program? You know, what are concerns for stakeholders in this area? Um, you know, and other care delivery considerations pertaining to, to telehealth um, as it becomes so much more widely adopted and utilized. Um, on the list here, on the screen here, are a list of several of the resources that we've put together, um, but and participated in, but certainly not an inclusive list. So uh, we have a lot of other great work uh, to highlight here at Media as well, and several um, exciting projects underway. And on the next slide, um, just a little detail on um, participating in our work group. We would love to have um, have the interested parties come join us we meet the third wednesday of each month from four to five eastern um 
we solicit, we really rely um, on the members of our work group to help us come up with ideas for projects and, and topics to and areas to explore. So it's a very collaborative group um, and we definitely encourage you to join. Uh, we won't task you with assignments unless you uh, are ready and willing to take them on. Um, so if you just want to join us and listen to, you know, we start off every call with hot topics in the news about telehealth um, and really dive into topics of interest for the um, people on the call and make sure we center our work around things that are of interest um, to our work group members and participants. So I will pause there uh, with our Weedy work group. Nancy, did I miss anything? Anything else you wanted to share about our uh, work on the telehealth work group at Weedy? No, I think you covered everything. I just wanted to say again that, um, you know, if you are a Weedy member, want to join us, please sign up and um, we'd love to have you join our conversations and our and uh, help us with our work. Thanks, Nancy. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Bowman, the director at CAQH Core. And what I would like to do also is way of introducing uh, the topic as well as the work that we are doing here at CAQH, um, really to provide, again, that introduction overview, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation for the rest of the afternoon. So if we go to the next slide, you see that, as many of you may know, CAQH has a number of initiatives that we work on to help really ease the business processes that usually take place between a provider and health plan. Obviously, with a lot of intermediaries that take part within those interactions and transactions. So we have shared utilities like ProView, right? Many of the providers on the call today probably know all about ProView as you enter in those demographic information and it is shared with health plans for credentialing purposes, for example. We also have our explorations where really is a tracking the adoption of electronic interactions and transactions between providers and health plans like electronic claims, electronic eligibility, those types of things are tracked in our index. Last but not least, the initiative um, near and dear to my heart as I am a director here at CAQH on our core initiative, and that is to look at the actual technological issues that exist between providers and health plans and the data needs between those two stakeholders and work together to resolve those issues. As you can imagine, there are a number of issues with telehealth related to all of these topics. On the next slide, on slide 10, if you're following along, um, we have worked really closely with the industry into resolving some of these issues because we are a mission and vision driven company. Um, we work really closely with our board. Our board is multi-stakeholder. We have five provider organizations and five health plan organizations um, that really work together, come together through consensus to approach these types of challenges and issues and how we can best resolve them together. Um, obviously, we work with all of the SDOs like X12, like HL7, like NACHA, like NCPDP, and obviously Weedy, right? Weedy is that education component that's so important for the industry. When we all kind of come together and work to resolve issues, it really helps the, those issues become uh, less impactful for the industry. There are a couple of things that we are working on, specific strategies and tactics that we highlight on slide 11 that we here at CAQH are working on, again, with our different constituencies and, diff and our different participants, um, we're all working together to resolve. For example, um, we're looking at the virtual care offerings for our provider directories. So there's certain demographic information that we now require to ensure that providers can let health plans know how they can interact with members using online uh, delivery of care. We also have started our virtual care directory data format. This was launched um, here in 20, late, I'm sorry, late in 2020, where we're looking at this task force was set up to specifically look at and address um, the framework that the industry needs and how better to work through virtual care information. Those data needs, again, from a provider perspective and the health plan perspective, sometimes they don't meet each up, right? So how can we work as a, so we set up this task force to help identify those issues, resolve those issues through communication, through dialogue, through consensus, and really kind of put out information for the industry to consume and hopefully make and improve that process. Here at CAQH Core, on the initiative that, that I'm directing along with Aaron Richter, um, uh, we are looking at a number of actual use cases where this data is really, really important. 
So we're looking at eligibility and benefits information. How can um, a provider know what the copay is, what the deductible is when it comes to uh, telemedicine type care or delivery of those care or services? That information may not always be consistent from plan to plan to plan. And as many providers may have to access multiple plans information, we wanna make that as consistent and as consumable by the provider um, at the time of care, at the time of delivery of service, uh, as possible. So we're working with our eligibility and benefits task group to identify those needs and then implement those through the use of operating rules for the industry. We're also going to be looking at the denial and adjustment codes because again, as claims come in, the result of that is a payment and providers have to understand if there's limitations or problems and mitigate those as quickly and easily and as automagically as possible, right? Um, so we're looking at how those types of messages back from the health plan if there has been a denial or an adjustment uh, and how the provider needs to consume that information and data. And last but not least, we also have our education and outreach, and this is our first example of it for the industry. We're really looking for um, how best to um, talk about these issues and topics and challenges uh, within the industry to ensure that we're really making progress. So those are the things that we're working on specifically here at CAQH and on CAQH Core. And again, um, with our first really education effort this afternoon. So with that, I'll hand the call over to Reed to get us kicked off on the next section, uh, some of the detail around the changing healthcare landscape as it consists of telehealth. So Reed, you're up next. Thanks, Bob. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I am excited to be here, uh, excited to kind of walk you through some of the the landscape considerations, but uh, also equally excited to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Kessler, um, who will tell you a little bit about herself and her work um, and, uh, and listen to her alongside you. Um, I think it's important to, to hear from healthcare providers that have been doing and healthcare systems that have been doing telehealth pre-COVID uh, to understand that, you know, you are not alone if you are new to it in this past year. Um, there's been a lot of changes. Um, and so I guess we can head to the next slide. Um, what I would say is that I have a lot of slides. I'm going to move through them somewhat quickly um, with the intent that they're there for you to come back to. Uh, anything that's underlined or blue blue text will be hyperlinked. You should be able to get those right out of the PDF that's in the right side of your, uh, your GoToMeeting platform. Um, but also with the intent that you know we can ask some questions and we can have a conversation um, because as Bob did allude to, there is a lot of variation within uh, some of the topics that I'm covering. Um, so last thing before I dive in, uh, I should introduce myself. I'm the project manager for the Northeast Telehealth Resource Centers. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Telehealth Resource Centers, I'll explain who we are in a second. Um, and I do want to just add a brief disclaimer. Uh, this is all for educational purposes. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and I have no legal training to sort of give you those kind of recommendations. Uh, these are my interpretations. Um, and you should definitely check with your risk and compliance officers or a similar system um, to talk about some of the things we're talking about today. Uh, I have no relevant sort of financial interest in the telehealth field, which is important to consider. Uh, on the next slide, um, just to briefly walk you through the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center ourselves, um, we are one of 14 TRCs around the nation. Um, we're a federally funded HRSA grant uh, here to assist with telehealth services. Uh, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, Netric is actually what we call ourselves because Northeast Telehealth Resource Center is a mouthful. Um, I joke that we have two parent organizations. So myself and some of our colleagues are uh, located at Medical Care Development, which is a global nonprofit public health institute. Um, and then we have some of our colleagues embedded with Sarah and their colleagues at the uh, University of Vermont Health Network um, that really add some clinical expertise to our squad. Um, what are we here to do? We're here to help. Uh, like most HRSA grants, we're here to increase access to care for the rural and underserved populations. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can show you all of the TRCs. Um, all 14 of us are here with that mission. Um, we're also here with the mission of increasing understanding and utilization of telehealth services. Uh, one of the reasons why I love my job is because that's a little broad, right? Uh, we are here to help. If you have a question, come come ask us. We'll point you towards some resources. We'll try to look it up for you. Um, and most of us have been around for nearly a decade now. And so we have a lot of examples and health system connections uh, that we can connect you to to learn from, you know, systematic workflow type considerations. Um, as you can see on the map here, 12 of us do divvy that the 50 states and U.S. territories up by region um, and then two of us are sort of nationally focused so cchp i believe some of you have heard may kwong on some of these webinars before 
Um, they're focused on distilling some of the telehealth policy stuff that I'm going to help you walk through in a few slides here. Um, they are a wealth of knowledge, Medicaid policy, Medicare policy, um, COVID waivers, all of it, all things telehealth policy, they track it. Uh, TTAC is a national one that uh, sort of tries to take some of the subjectivity out of telehealth technology assessment. Um, there's a lot more that goes into deciding which telehealth technology you want to utilize for your care avenue um, than just the price point and the design of it. And so they like to, you know, they do a great job of uh, helping you look at the difference in maybe camera specificities or, you know, storage capacity and things like that um, and help people understand uh, some of the interoperability considerations that I think a lot of this group might be more familiar with the telehealth realm uh, experience. Uh, anyways, enough about us. On the next slide here, we, oh yeah, all right, I have one more, sorry. <laughs> so I, I kind of covered this. I mean, all things telehealth, feel free to reach out. We are a consortium, um, so we have an, our own website there uh, that actually you can get a hold of all 14 of us, but each of the 14 TRCs have their own websites and contact methods as well. Um, if you're not familiar, reach out to me and I'm happy to connect you with your regional one as well. Um, but yeah, we can head to the next slide, thank you. So I thought it was important just to sort of embrace uh, the landscape that we're all coming into, right? Uh, if we're going to talk about what telehealth looked like before COVID uh, and what it looks like currently, before we talk about what it looks like, could look like moving forward, um, it's important to recognize just, uh, I'm going to stick with a scenario I use a lot, just how much toothpaste kind of got squeezed out of the tube over the past year and how much uh, experience we've all been gaining. Uh, so this slide is just a few articles that you'll be able to click on and review uh, that just shows, you know, the the breadth of the telehealth topics that we've talked about in a, you know, in the national media, in the main spotlight um, over the past year. It's quite a bit different <laughs> than uh, I think how the landscape was sort of being interacted with in, you know, even February of 2020. Uh, and so I think this is a helpful framing to keep in mind as we look at some of the policy stuff is just that there is a lot of variation and uh, currently available due to the flexibilities and the waivers. And therefore, there's a lot of neat and innovative possibilities that have been happening um, and the intersection of where all that goes moving forward. Again, just keep it in mind. Uh, we can move to the next slide. I think I have a couple more just sort of examples for folks to be able to refer back to. Uh, these are actually looking at uh, groups within our region or just extremely you know, unique use cases in my experience. Um, just again, hammering home the point that over this past year, we have seen a ton of things that either due to reimbursement structure, uh, due to connect, uh, connectivity considerations, policy definitions, whatever the consideration may be that is no longer currently in place, um, we've gotten to see some really unique things, right? So like mobile health uh, interactions via games, uh, video games, whether it's a cell phone app or otherwise for adolescent care is something that if I had to waiver, uh, wager, you were probably able to do and being reimbursed for through maybe a private pay system um, or some type of insurance, but it's not something that was covered through Medicare or Medicaid. Currently, it is something that you could explore if you had the proper workflows in place. Um, and there's been some really neat studies on the efficacy of that. Um, you know, some of the other wearable things like the sleep technology thing that I've got on this slide, that is something that uh, historically there's been a little bit less inundation of because uh, wearable technology actually goes through the FDA for approval before uh, it can be put on the market. And so that market was expanding, but at a much slower rate. We've seen a lot of tech sort of uh, look at what you can get from biometric data. And so that has also, you know, resulted in some really unique and powerful uh, case studies that are important to keep in mind when we're looking at what we, where we're headed. Uh, we can head to the next slide and it is going to be a pretty brief one. I mean, it's just to add a little bit of visualization to the amount of text I'm about to show you. Um, I referred to the toothpaste in the tube scenario, uh, scenario a few minutes ago. And that's really how I look at this next section of slides that we're going through. Um, I think it's important for people to understand what was in the tube before COVID and um, how that inter interacts with what is currently, you know, sort of sitting on your on your bathroom uh, sink or, or whatever you want to look at it um, and where you would be looking for certain aspects of waivers that maybe have not been discussed, you know, where you can find things that are evolving at the state level versus federal level, so on and so forth. But it's very much a moving target. You know, I mean, uh, federal Congress is still in session. Uh, a lot of state session uh, legislatures are still in session. There are some that have just finished up. Um, and so it is a little bit of an evolving landscape. Uh, these links that I've picked should be 
useful in perpetuity because they're entities that are trying to track that evolving landscape. But it's important to keep in mind, things are rapidly changing right now. Uh, we can head to the next slide. Uh, Bob kind of summarized what your barrier, what your work group, what this audience might have considered for barriers for technology integration with healthcare pre-COVID. I thought he did a really great job of it. But uh, the reason why I grabbed this slide is, you know, it is uh, from the other aspect of it, right? Like I personally, in my role as a TRC, I did not necessarily get that much of a chance to talk to the folks that are thinking about the HIE, the high tech, the EHR integration stuff at a health system. I was more likely to get a question from the actual healthcare provider, right? And so the the barriers, although somewhat similar at the root of them, uh, sort of present themselves differently. And they're also more interacting with policy, right? And so drivers are probably the same, right? Like uh, there is expanding reimbursement for these new models. Uh, there's reform happening in the healthcare design system and uh, increases connectivity and computer and technology have allowed for these new opportunities. That's one of the reasons why telehealth was taken off for over the last two decades. Um, some of the other ones that I think maybe are a little bit more from the you know actual uh, healthcare provider perspective is that there was provider shortages uh, in a lot of states in our US, you know, whether it's a specialist provider or a general provider or a nurse practitioner or any kind of healthcare professional, um, we are an aging healthcare profession. And so it's uh, the ability to connect to different providers that are needed for patient care through technology was growing in interest and therefore telehealth you know, capacity was also growing in interest. Uh, when you look at the other side though, it's like intentionally larger um, in the sense uh, from my perspective, I intentionally made it larger, I should say. Uh, it Because there was, if not completely equal, almost more likely more uh, barriers to consider when you were starting up your telehealth process pre-COVID, uh, if, you, you know, if you're trying to do this before this past year. Um, you had to think about the cost of the software and the interoperability to it, right? Like whether or not your electronic health record was going to connect to the video engagement platform that you've chosen or, or whether both of those are going to connect to the device that you've picked. Um, that was a thought process that you had to go through. And that was something that takes time as well, right? Time and effort from a healthcare system that, you know, across the board, uh, employees are pretty busy. Uh, access to technology and broadband, that's sort of, uh, there's multifaceted things. And I think we cover that a little bit later. Um, and it's a part of the discussion as well, I'm pretty sure. But that has been really, you know, uh, necessarily and rightfully so in the spotlight over the past year, the digital divide. Um, it's something that existed before COVID as well, right? And it, uh, it wasn't just sort of to the patient home. That's a new perspective, which is, I think, part of the reason why it's such a big discussion, because there's more focus, because there's more areas to see the focus of. Um, but whether or not your building had the capacity to have multiple telehealth rooms and you had the broadband strength, you know, or if there was going to be Ethernet connections in certain rooms, that's a consideration that is uh, important to think about, you know, as we move forward, but also was very much something that was, was a prudent thing to think about pre-COVID because reimbursement, as I'll explain, was focused primarily on the healthcare to healthcare interaction, right? So healthcare site, healthcare site connection. Um, and if you have the bandwidth to do that is a debate, it's still a debate. It's still a necessary conversation. Um, licensure, we'll cover that a little bit, but that was also on there. Privacy and security concerns. Um, I actually think that that's something that we've learned a lot about over the past year. But it, as you know, all of you are probably familiar with the HIPAA uh, and there's HIPAA considerations around this. There's data security considerations around this. And so there's just a few more protocols. And I think that kind of sums up these last few bullets here is that there's just a few more protocols. It was another process to think through. Um, and so even if you were, knew you were looking at a reimbursable and permissible option, it was just another, uh, a few other barriers, a few other layers to keep in mind. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next slide because I think that is best summed up or best kind of made into an action item on this slide, right? And so uh, what I'm going to cover after this hopefully helps you understand where the waivers and the reimbursements or the waivers and the flexibilities are currently aligned, whether it's federal or state level. Um, and in order to do that, I think it's important to recognize that it's not just recent telehealth policy that interacts with the definitions and the reimbursement structure that we have. Like it's not just something that's passed in 2005. Um, we've been defining telehealth as at the federal level or telecommunications is probably the better word and technology um, at the federal level for years now. 
Um, and I think you can kind of naturally see, you know, a definition of telecommunications in 1997 is not, is almost guaranteed not going to be able to capture the full range of possibilities that are now available for telecommunications in 2021. However, you can also see when you look at the name of that bill there, when you look at the bullets that are sort of tied in within that, uh, the bills that we've added technology and telecommunication definitions for historically are relatively like landmark policy, not just telehealth legislation, but policy. Like those are, you know, stalwarts of the American system. I mean, so it is a political discussion. It's a congressional discussion is a more important part. Like these are things that would need to be changed by Congress uh, for Medicare to act upon them, these policies, uh, they would need to be amended. Um, and because of that, even when Medicare was proposing new payment systems or Medicaid programs were becoming more permissive, um, some, of the, some of the barriers that I just described would still be present, right? Because the, uh, the statutory policy and the rulemaking of that is tied to some pretty some pretty important legislation. That's the main takeaway here. Like I, this is definitely one of the slides where I hope you refer back to because I think the the black bullets are incredibly important here. But I'm definitely not a, uh, diving into them as much as I should. Um, so definitely read these, refer back. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, if we look at the next slide, um, we start to see some of the expansion, some of the explosion, right? Some of this past year. Um, so when the first and second, maybe even the third round of waivers and flexibilities were sort of put into place, February and March. Um, all of those barriers that I just talked about, all the considerations I just talked about, they, they were gone, right, overnight. Now you could now do a patient, you could see a patient in the home, and it didn't even necessarily have to be over video. You could call them through the phone if that was what you needed to do, and the goal was rightfully so, to decrease the human interaction, to try to stop the spread of the virus and hopefully sort of mitigate some of the spread of the pandemic. Um, but it also has, uh, I think anyone would say, lasted a lot uh, longer than I think probably initially thought, and it is created a situation where we have a lot to think about as we roll back every audience, right? So if, they, if the telehealth connection for the last year, if you live in a rural area like I do, and the telehealth connection has been phone only for some of your patients over the last year, like, you know, that's not ideal. Your patient probably knows that that's not ideal. And so like, what kind of considerations are there? I, I think that it's important to recognize that audio only was a connection that worked, right? And there are clinical reasons where you may deem it's medically prudent or medically necessary to do audio only. Um, but that's a conversation that we need to have, right? And so like part of what these next couple of slides are hopefully going to be able to do is help you realize, you know, where your voice can be heard, where you can, you know, be a part of uh, the conversation at a system level, um, at a, you know, a value-based care model, whatever you're, whatever you're operating within. How do you uh, understand what's what we're talking about, making permanent and or sort of reverting back in some fashion? Um, in the right, if this all goes well, like uh, if this all goes best case scenario, right? If in my mind, um, the, digi the digitally enabled care that leverages technology and data uh, would become sort of more central to the healthcare that we deploy, right? And so, uh, it's Dr. Nundy, that's an actually direct quote from a book he just recently published, but I think it sort of hammers on the point, right? That like right now we have a chance to look at the policy and implementation structures in a more wholesome way than really we've ever been able to before. And if people are involved in the right stages, there can be some very powerful new care models sort of that emerge out of it. It could be, as you've probably read in the news plenty of times, like one of the silver linings of the past 16 months. Um, on the next slide, I try to, thank you, uh, I try to uh, help break it down, right? I've said various waivers and flexibilities plenty of times. That doesn't help you. <laughs> but here's how it can, right? So connect by any modality. I didn't do my classic telehealth 101 slide because I'm sure folks are familiar with it. But if I had the definition, the words that you would see definitionally are synchronous. That means video, right? Live video. That's what we're doing today. Asynchronous. Um, it's a little bit of a catch-all bucket, but just take that word at definition. It's a non in real time contact, whether that is through a, you know, a an electronic communication method uh, on its own or electronic communication method sort of augmenting a, you know, a potential video follow up in the same hour. It's a non a non live transfer of health communication methods. That's another bucket, another modality. Uh, remote patient monitoring is uh, 
it's what it sounds like, right? It's you're monitoring your patient's bio vitals, uh, biometrics in a non-healthcare setting. Uh, that was pretty limited pre-COVID. That was something that, you know, I think uh, whether it was chronic care management or outpatient follow-up or some home visiting nursing programs, that was really the only places that you were going to see that be uh, sort of actionable, right? There was reimbursement structures to support the effort. Uh, currently, that's that's very allowable. A lot of states are making it so the the patient home and or you know other secure settings can be a healthcare location moving forward. And in that scenario, that's a new modality, right? That's something that we've sort of experienced over the past year. So that highlights some of it. Uh, state licensure requirements, I touched on that previously, but licensure is a state by state determination. Um, and so historically, and like what we're headed back towards is if you were a provider, and your patient was in another state, your privileges and sort of structure around what you would be able to do and what is permissible is determined by that state where your patient is in. Um, and so some states have an expedited licensure process for providers that are trying to do that exact care avenue with an established patient. Others do not, and it's a full license effort. Um, others participate in specific medical licensure compacts um, that are a streamlined application process for any number of states that are participating in that specific one. But that's a uh, that's a that's its own ball of wax, right? And that is something that has been sort of relaxed over this past year. Um, it is important to think about HIPAA provisions, same type of thing. There's a lot that goes in there, right? Like, is the door shut behind them? Can you guarantee that you're interacting with your patient? Do you know they're safe and sound? Um, there are specific actions that health systems would take to make sure they were hitting the bullets that are, you know, touching on that within HIPAA. Um, the Office of Civil Rights relaxed those provisions in early 2020, and they're currently still relaxed. But that would be an Office of Civil Rights thing that you that would be tracked. Uh, patient location, that's in a couple of places. I've touched on it a few times, but uh, CMS has currently allowed for most locations to be an actionable health care site. The originating site is what it would be called definitionally. Uh, originating site, patient, distant site, provider. Provider type expansions, that's a huge one, right? I, I touched on that earlier uh, with some of the success stories, but uh, you know, uh, case in point, my, my mom's a physical therapist, so I, I've been focusing on this one a lot. There's been some cool stuff that's come out here, but I think physical therapy and occupational therapy is probably one that a lot of people, myself included, would have been hesitant to say there's a value add by doing telehealth, right? But there is a value add when you think about states that have long drives, when you think about you know maybe traveling physical therapists and the, the amount of effort that that company is putting into having that therapist drive to a location. Um, and there's been a lot of health there's been a lot of you know PT companies that have shown that they can do if they have the proper paperwork and system set up to help the patient set up the proper heights for stretches and so on and so forth, that they can do a video visit and maybe decrease the amount of times that they have to have that patient make that commute or vice versa. Um, but all of that is something that's new. Um, that's a that's a flexibility that's been here. Uh, so shifting down to the second bucket where it says but will it with maybe too many question marks I feel a little ominous um i think that's important to point out because if you have been in this uh space in the past year and you've started to look at policy and you've started to look at the reimbursement and figure out how you as a health system are going to utilize telehealth moving forward um you've probably picked up on the fact that there are some health systems and some you know associations and such myself included that are like very very actively focusing on the public health emergency expiration dates and the days that the waivers are, you know, sort of permissible and so on and so forth. Um, and I think I've gotten a little bit more clarity on that, but I wanna, the reason why I set these last bullets up like that is to give that to you, right? Um, so in, I believe it was in March when the actual sort of first PHE went and it was post-dated. But either way, last year in 2020, the first public health emergency PHE was put out by the ASPR, uh, branch of DHHS, which is the, the division that actually has the regulatory authority to uh, administer that. And it was for a 90 day window. Um, and ever since we've had 90 day extensions at the federal level, um, some of the interest I think over this past year has been like, how, how do you know when that's gonna end other than just watching for it? Uh, and I think part of the reason why I've been so interested is uh, a bullet that isn't kind of, I guess, kind of, explicitly here um when potus biden stepped into this current administration when our current administration kicked off they did issue a letter saying that the public health emergency would likely go through 2021 um and they did say that they would give you know at least 30 days notice um 
but I'm relatively uh, new to, you know, like actually digging into policy. And I was a little kind of confused as to why they wouldn't just get that done. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you just extend it? Uh, the way that we have our system set up, it's no different than how a state's governor can only issue executive orders for a certain amount of days as issued by, you know, the state statute. Um, ASPR's PHE windows are 90 days exclusively. That's the way that, you know, we've set it up in statute and that's what they're able to actionably do. So it will, we're, if, if it does go through 2021, it might go further, um, but it is a, a 90 day update every single time. And so the next time that it would sort of get signed and extended it would actually be the end of this month. Um, given that we are sort of within inside the 30 day window of what the current administration had uh, suggested to the governors that they would you know, notify within, we should be, uh, it's, I'm fairly confident that that will get extended, but it is something to keep in mind that that would be, it would be ASPR that would actually sort of formally end the public health emergency and then CMS, Office of Civil Rights, any other sort of federal office that has a waiver or flexibility would have, uh, you know, X amount of time as, de as de defined by that secretary when they end the public health emergency to make permanent those waivers. However, that does not take into account legislation. Um, I really didn't dive into federal legislation here intentionally because it's very active. There's a ton going on. I think there's over 50 bills in the federal federal legislative floor right now. Um, I did try to link to uh, some states and how it's playing out. I'm from the Northeast, which is why I picked Maine and New Hampshire, but it's a great example of how uh, state policy and public health uh, emergency actions might interplay. Um, looking at the time, I'm going to move past that while I explain it to you. Um, it is, it really kind of on the next slide, it, it, the states that are making actions are diving into this blue bucket here, right? And it's it's how permissive their policy was beforehand um, and how, how, uh, how far they wanted to go in the current act of the legislation, right? And so, but Maine and New Hampshire are great examples because uh, Maine uh, previously had a very progressive telehealth policy. Uh, and so it was a little bit more of a audio only centric focused discussion within the main legislature about whether or not that was gonna pass along with like provider types and some of the other things that I've covered, but they had expanded site locations and such previously. Um, and so it was a pretty like, you know, focused and finite discussion. Um, New Hampshire's executive order ending was actually pretty uh, quick and easy in terms of how the executive order act ended because their legislative, body had passed a uh, bill in the previous session that made permanent all of the tel COVID telehealth flexibilities that the state of New Hampshire statute had allowed. Um, and so when uh, Governor Sununu ended the executive order for the state of New Hampshire, the telehealth provisions for New Hampshire state Medicaid and the, you know, the payers within New Hampshire sort of just instantly rolled into what they had uh, done for their new legislation. Now there is a discussion around the rulemaking of that and some of the board things, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, and again, just the last thing I want to point out here, uh, Medicare is where a lot of some of the uh, changes and waivers and restrictions and possibilities Why? And so it's important to keep that in mind because the federal uh, discussion is very much happening right now. Uh, we can go to the next slide here. And I might, yeah, all right. Now we're getting to the part of where I sort of wrap up. <laughs> so, with all that landscape opening up, I, like I referenced this earlier, I think it's really important to recognize everybody has a role in maintaining the landscape uh, and you know defining how it's set. Um, and if you have been implementing telehealth in your system, you are sort of uniquely uh, aligned to have this conversation with the everybody that I'm laying out right here, right? If you have providers that have been doing telehealth for the first time or telehealth through a new modality um, or so on and so forth, like you, there's feedback mechanisms that you should be utilizing and trying to make sure you understand how that worked. Um, there, the, the provider input is probably paramount in terms of how this shakes out. Equally important though are the patients, right? Like the patient location I've referenced a few times is a big uh, sort of change. Uh, it's important to know how they felt about that. It's important to know if like if that wouldn't have mattered, you know, if they live somewhere and they don't have broadband and they can't do audio only, they'll still be coming in like that type of thing. You have hopefully uh, encountered some of those conversations with your patients and like uh, standardizing that, you know, conceptualizing it is important. Um, Payers and policymakers, I think that's pretty obvious uh, as to where they play in here. But the technology companies, as we move to the next slide, I do think that's a, a a bullet to think about. Um, 
I'm going to come back to it actually, because my slides are in different order than I realized. Uh, because they have a lot of changes they could be making and they're trying to make, and it's important they get the the uh, people that involved that they need to hear it from. But no, it, we were on the right slide. I just am mentally turned around. Sorry. <laughs> so the reimbursement structure, as I've already defined, would be issued after any policy changes or regulatory waivers are made permanent or relaxed or put back or whatever ends up happening. Um, and that, as you probably all are aware, does differ at levels, but it is important to make sure that I've listed all, that all out so you can keep that straight in case that is the landscape we go back to, right? So uh, there were, if we go to the next slide, actually, I have some numbers to kind of help highlight why it's important for you to look at those bullets. Uh, all 50 states as of 2020 for the first time did have definitions for telemedicine and did define live video and reimburse for live video. And so that was a, you know, a sign of how far telehealth is kind of expanding and how quickly it was going. Um, however, when you add the next slide or when you add the next bullets on there, you can start to see where the variation was going to differ um, because states reimbursing for service in the home of the patient and states reimbursing for remote patient monitoring are times where state the state medicaid policy and the state telehealth statute has become more permissive than the federal statute put my hands back in here so you can see it than the federal statute right and so that is now a new that's a variation you'd have to think about whether or not your your uh, patient is using a state uh, state insurance plan or the federal insurance plan or are they using a private payer or uh, you know, employee payer, um, because those are a different set of policies potentially, whether or not a state has policy payment and all of that type of thing. Um, I have some other stats there that kind of hammer at home, but we can look at the next slide for them. So uh, you know, 15 states I mentioned that are looking at home as the patient site. Uh, 13 states are looking at the FQHC as a patient as a provider site. Um, and if you are a community health center, a federally qualified community health center or a rural health center, um, the ability to have your provider be the reimbursable place of service has been pretty key over this past year, but that is not something that was necessarily happening nationwide previously. Uh, teledentistry, new care model, only seven states were doing that pre-COVID. Um, there's been a lot of exciting sort of successes that have been shown out of that the past year. Um, and so I think while I've been talking, you've hopefully been looking at these bullets. Uh, it, there has been adoption through experience or through innovation oh, uh, for the last 20 years or so, uh, but it has not been nearly as fast as the adoption through experience and innovation of this past year. So what does that look like as we move forward? That's really where everybody plays in. Um, and if we go to this next slide, the predictions, if I had to make some, you know, I think that we have, there's been a lot of toothpaste out of the tube for over a year. I think that the, it's, there's going to be an expectation from hopefully the majority of providers, but at least some providers, um, and hopefully the majority of patients, but at least some patients, that uh, we're not going back to healthcare as we had it over this past year. You know, the previous CMS administrator, I used to use her quote a lot, and said the genie's out of the bottle. It's like, what does that look like? Um, when we when we get there, that's one of the things I'm excited to have Sarah talk to you a little bit about. Um, but it's very much, uh, it's up in the air and it's important for folks to think about because there's been so many new things experienced over the past year. You should find a happy middle ground, right? Like I, I would imagine there's not a single healthcare system in the US that's like, I wanna do everything with no in-person visits ever again. Um, but there is probably value to having the ability to do telehealth uh, modality interactions with your patients through almost every care avenue in some fashion. And so understanding that you know hybrid models of care are probably where we're headed and how to lay that out is uh, is where we're headed. And that's that's my prediction is that we're gonna see more hybrid hybrid models of care that you know that you can already see broadband being expanded, which would allow that. Um, you're starting to see new community organization opportunities like libraries and schools and other things like that. Um, and that would really kind of continue to allow for more potential hybrid models of care and increase the connectivity and continuity of care as well. Uh, interoperability, I do think is critical. Um, I think that's uh, something that I can sort of come back to during the discussion. But like the that's uh, if we go to the next slide, that starts to play in when you think about the things that, the questions that are on everybody's mind, right? Like where does technology play into this? Uh, there's a, there's a, a lot of ways. The patient's access to technology is something that uh, it's both digital divide and digital literacy, right? Like somebody could have broadband and not fully understand how to get onto their video camera, things like that. Uh, 
workflows, uh, how well you can interact it both within the systems you have and within the provider's day-to-day -day work. How are we going to work with that? Technology is a place to play there. Uh, Non-integrated communication tools, I think that's important to think about for uh, patients, uh, health centers that have a sort of a diverse patient population. You might need translators that uh, maybe are not a part of your normal clinical workflow, but whether or not you can add them to your video interaction and things like that is important to consider. And how are we doing that? It's, uh, it's going to be up for debate. And like I said, I think everybody's got a place to play in that sort of avenue. Um, the other bullets, I think we've summed up pretty well. And yeah, so I, I just have, I believe, one more slide. Two more, but Sarah, I'm gonna let you take the last one. I just wanted to highlight some innovative tech uh, to kind of to point out what exactly what I'm getting at, right? Like we in this past year, because of all of the things that all you providers and health systems have been able to try, uh, technology companies are starting to get uh, starting to get a little bit creative. You know, their R&D departments are looking at things in new ways. I will say that high, that gel patch on the right that you see there, full disclaimer, that's a European care model. Um, it's not here in the U.S. yet, but it could be, um, and it's something that is pretty innovative. So that's actually that is a, a like a. A, an athletic trainer, PTOT, that's a, that's a therapy sort of patch, right? It's going to send a stimulant electronic shock to the patient uh, wherever they wear it, but they would be able to sort of leave the facility and, and their encounter there and do that on their own. Uh, working to the left to the right here, you know, a smart pill bottle that maybe can, uh, can automatically connect to the pharmacist uh, in, or start the process of a refill, but also, you know, for somebody that maybe is in a PMP model or some other sort of controlled substance, it can also connect to the provider and make sure that the proper protocols and interactions are happening. Like that type of technology is possible if, if we design systems that allow for it. Uh, looking at the other ones here, those are things that I think are going to happen regardless, right? So that space that you see, that box where it says your space to discover or magic connect, that's the Delaware Public Library, or one of the public libraries in Delaware. Uh, it's a it's a telehealth compliant room. It's HIPAA compliant. They can shut and lock that door if they need to, but it's also a little bit more broader. So it's still community usable, right? Like a, you can use that computer to get your homework done. You could use it for a variety of things. You could use it for a job interview, but it could also be a healthcare site. Uh, actually, I think the thing that I will say before I turn it over to Sarah, where I do think we all have a voice in helping technology do it is like, what is the technology not doing right now, right? Like if you can't connect to, if you're having patients that are having a hard time getting onto your video platform, why is that happening? Is it is it just because you don't have a web portal adaption, you know, so they can get to it from the web, they need to have the platform? Is it because it's not going through the patient portal, so on and so forth? That's not part of it. Uh, but this company here, um, I don't often, call out a specific vendors, but I will call out these guys because they're doing some neat research. GrandPad, um, they've been looking at the the design of the touchscreen itself. Um, and they're actually, there's, as we get older, we lose moisture in our fingers. Um, and so the touchscreens are not as receptive to the elderly population or really probably half of Americans um, that are over, you know, X age, whenever you start to lose that moisture. And so they're developing tablets that are sort of tailored for maybe less young fingers, be a little bit more receptive, a little bit easier to use, things like that. That can really only happen in design if we are uh, all making sure that our experiences are you know, tied into that. Um, I do have one more slide here, but I know for a fact that Sarah can cover it and she has some slides I want everybody to hear. So I'm gonna turn it over there. Thanks, Reed. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Kessler and I am part of the telehealth team for University of Vermont Health Network. Um, and I do have a few slides and so I'm actually gonna skip this, no offense Reed, but I think I speak to this a little bit in my deck and then we can get into questions and answers after. So quick introduction to my organization. Um, we are a network comprised of six hospitals um, throughout Vermont and Northern New York. We also have one home health and hospice system embedded in that work and we serve about 1 million patients. Um, and UVM Medical Center, which is where I'm actually based out of, is an academic medical center. We can move forward. Thank you. So I've been a part of the telehealth team um, for the network for about three and a half years. And I loved Reed's analogy about the toothpaste coming out of the um, the 
the case. And so this slide is comparing what we saw in 2019 compared to 2020 and today. And I'll go through this very quickly. We did have several telehealth programs. The majority of those were video visit programs. We had about 25 live by the end of the year of 2019. We use Zoom as our video visit platform. And we had about 150 users at the end of the year. We targeted 1,000 visits per year, um, kind of uh, laughed about that because at the time that was a stretch. Now, if you look at the bottom bullets, we have about 100 meetings every hour. If you look on your Zoom dashboard, you can look at what's happening in real time. And at most points during the day, other than you know 12 to one or four to five, we have about 100 meetings happening or visits happening at a time. Last year in 2020, we had 204,000 video visits uh, through our network, um, actually four of the six hospitals. And that was about 157,000 distinct patients. Um, we use Epic, we're an Epic customer, and so we have our patients using MyChart. Um, part of that is a MyChart televideo visit workflow, but the majority of that work is using Zoom um, integrated with Outlook, and that's how our schedulers schedule. We can move forward. Thank you. Some statistics that I'd love to share from last year and this year. The upper left, we have some points about volume. So again, 204,000 visits uh, last year. And that was really only tracking March through December because, of course, March is when we had to shift our focus and a lot of our patients were not coming in to be seen. They were being seen video or audio. That's a 99% increase from 2019 to 2020. Year to date thus far in 2021, we have about 82,000 video visits, which from our telehealth volume, so we're, we're talking video and audio, that's 75% of that volume. We've also been doing some better reporting this year, and we've been able to track hours saved with these video visits and miles saved. And so far this year, we have about 73,000 hours saved and 1.3 million miles saved. So we have, we are in Vermont, which is a small state in upstate New York, but we have patients who come from two and a half hours away every day to be seen. And so this is such a wonderful opportunity when appropriate for those patients and that's incorporated into that. Clinical indications, so um, in 2019, the majority of the programs we had were primary care, pediatrics, neurology, um, and psychiatry. And now we've learned a lot more about specific neurological um, subspecialties that are appropriate for video visits or a lot of endocrinology. We even have a lot of orthopedics that are appropriate for video. Um, demographics, we weren't really surprised by this, but it is always interesting to look back. The group who utilized video visits the most were the age cohort 18 to 44, which is broad, but that's that's the piece. Um, and then age ages zero to 17, so our younger population actually utilized video visits more than they utilized in-person visits. And then the bottom right is a quote. We've done a lot of patient feedback. We use Prescani and we added in a lot of specific telemedicine questions over the last year. And we've gotten some really great feedback to be able to make some improvements and just obtain some really great quotes that we can bring back to our care teams and share the success stories. And we can move forward. With regards to audio only or telephone visits, we did do telephone visits prior to 2020. Um, at that point in time, we were not billing for them. Uh, we had a couple pilot programs. Now, of course, it's embedded into everyday clinics for some of our specialties. We did, so in 2020, same time period, March through December, we did about 135,000 telephone visits. Thus far in 2021, we've done 28,000 and we've saved 22,000 hours and 990,000 miles. 
Um, and recently in the state of Vermont, the legislature has passed a law that actually requires insurers to cover telephone visits, so audio only encounters. Uh, they're still working on the rate of reimbursement, but that's a really that's a really positive step for us. And patient feedback has been that it's just really appreciated that they have this opportunity, um, not taking the time out even to join Zoom or um, come in, as we know, but they can receive a phone call or make a phone call and connect that way. And there's a quote in the bottom right, and this is, this is so meaningful, and it really captures what we did last year. Patients would not have received services some patients if it weren't for the ability to have an audio only encounter. And we can move forward. So last year, in addition to increasing volume and uh, adding in some really great specific questions for our patients, there was a lot of growth internally too. We had a lot of leadership attention and buy-in to what we were doing. 2019 and before it was like we would partner with services and hope that they wanted to offer telehealth now people are coming to us leaders are coming to us and they're really partnering on what we've learned how we can make it better for our patients for our providers for our region and it's really exciting that we're there we've created um some partnerships with our desk side support team so devices and technology within our network medical group operations and leadership uh, they also have a medical group education and training team and we work very closely with them to train and create new materials and be able to share those and store them centrally providing them to patients any end user within the network and my team as well um, marketing our patient experience and patient um, we have patient advocates who engage with us during our project so they can lend that patient perspective. That's been a really meaningful partnership. And we have a patient access and service center who does preparation with patients prior to their video visit. So they're comfortable with Zoom. They know what the link looks like. They can go through a test. They get what the look and feel is and what the expectation is. And that's that's been really valuable too. We can move forward. The next several slides are regarding, they're all titled what we heard and then they touch on different pieces. Um, and we can go through these really, really quickly. I The, the um, point to drive home is that after we did this, what we called a rapid rollout and we expanded services to all of our uh, specialties and subspecialties, we did some user design sessions, so user design thinking. Um, we did some brainstorming with schedulers, patients, providers, uh, roomers who go through um, in room, because we still have the rooming process, uh, for video visits. And we got a lot of feedback, and we were able to break the feedback into different areas so these slides kind of speak to that so this first one is patient attitudes and what they appreciate and have noted about the visits and we can jump to the next uh, video visit quality in general so um, how it looked for them how it felt for them one of the one of the bullets here is the benefit really to seeing patients in their home environment we heard that a lot actually um, next slide this one is regard to video visit appropriateness. So that was something in 2019 and before that we weren't totally clear on what really is appropriate for a video, what is really valuable for this service. And we learned so much last year that now we can make recommendations or our medical group has an algorithm and a process to determine what's most appropriate for the patient. Uh, next slide. Uh, we heard about some challenges. Um, we unfortunately have a lot of unreliable connectivity throughout our state and there is a state initiative to work on broadband connectivity, uh, which is really exciting, but that's the majority of uh, what we heard about the challenges is just that internet and connectivity um, as a barrier through our region. Next slide. Provider and staff satisfaction is so important to us and we are consistently in touch with our teams to obtain that. So that did not stop there. Uh, next slide. 
um, telehealth expansion. So again, taking into the account all of the feedback that we've heard, how can we expand in the right way and make process improvements? Next slide. And where we're going is we are shifting to more of the MyChart televideo integration between Zoom and Epic, um, rolling out e-consults, which is an Epic uh, communication between PCP and specialist, um, and working more with our FQHCs, uh, regional partner specific to uh, emergency medicine or EMS teams and partnering more with uh, the teams that we created some really valuable partnerships last year. And I think that's all I have, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah and Reed. I, one thing I was realizing as I listened to your very informative uh, presentations is that I'm glad this is a series because clearly we have a lot more to talk about um, in, uh, on this topic. Um, thank you to our speakers and thank you to our audience. And the last thing I'll leave you with is when you receive these slides uh, in the next day or so, there's also an appendix section um, that has even more resources uh, for you uh, to have. Um, have a good afternoon, and we'll see you at the next webinar.